Hello and uh, welcome back to the channel where we are going to have a look back on a weekend um, where you know there's a lot of history made, um, a lot of emotional matches and uh, I'm joined as usual by uh, Connor McKenna here. Um, so you know it was, as I say it was a fantastic weekend of games and uh, I think that the place where, where we have to start is uh, the scenes in, uh, in Munster where Tipperary won their first Monster football title in 85 years and you know the weekend that it was it, it, it felt like it was um it really was something from above um what did you uh, what did you make of the game I thought it was <coughs> fantastic Jerry, winning on the the weekend that was in it I thought tip were were excellent on the day I think they thoroughly deserved their three point win I think they probably should have won by a lot more to be honest with you I think that they really came with an intensity of belief a, a genuine they they really thought they were going to do it in in Port Quiver, and it must be the greatest GA story of all time. Like a team winning a hundred, their 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 first provincial title in eighty five years, on the anniversary of one of their former players who was shot dead that weekend, the hundredth year anniversary. It was really really fantastic from Tip, and I suppose it's come down to the Limerick game. They were dead and beaten, and Connor Sweeney put put the free over Morris for Cheryl Desk it was a sideline ball even in the last minute, and then. Look at Limerick missed a free in, in front of the post late, or a mark even in front of the post very late on. So I think that everything kind of fell in Tipperary's favour to get to the Munster final. They played very well against Clare. The Limerick game, they got their, their bit of luck and then they kind of took it on the day. I think Cork were a bit, a small bit unfortunate with injuries with, um, with Sean Powder not being fit to play and Luke Conley was having a great game, was forced off injured at half time. So Cork were a small bit unlucky. They never really got going. They were second best throughout. But I think the Cork against Kerry in semi final. I think that they really, I wouldn't say the road they looked that day, but they didn't really play exceptionally well, yet they still beat Kerry in that game. But I think overall, it's been a very good year for the Cork footballers. And only this can really take away from it. Like they got, they won the league, won all, well, they won six games and got a walk over the other. They got, and then they bet Kerry. So that's a very good year in that sense. But for Tip, they're still in Division 3, but that they, they won't really be too bothered about that at the moment. But David Power had, must be a brilliant, he's a brilliant manager. He won not earn a minor title with Tip in 2011, and now he's after pulling this out of the bag and the other and minor was they bet Dublin in the final against the odds and some of those Dublin players were the fulcrum of that team that won five in a row like so I think that's really really super from Tip and with maybe just to pick out a few players Michael Quinlan and Connor Sweeney and, and Colin Murray in the midfield there they have some of the best footballers in the in Ireland Tip in, in, in those lads so I, I, I think that they have absolutely no no fear of Mayo in the next one and Colin Reardon was absolutely brilliant yesterday he was like he was really one of those AFL lads and he made a huge difference, and they have absolutely nothing to fear against Mayo um, coming to the semi final. Yes, of course, that uh, that semi final in two weeks. I think, um, obviously, we'll, we'll not write anybody off yet, but you know, the fact that it's um, the fact that it's not the dubs, um, you know, it seems to be like they seem to be almost on a wee level of their own, and we'll get to that. But, but certainly, Tipperary and Mayo, um, placed in the All Ireland final, like you know. Tip got the semi-finals a couple of years ago, and and they're back again. But um, do you know that they got all obviously the weekend that it was a such, but like be there as well as as monster champions, eighty five years. Like it's it, it's actually remarkable that it's been as long as it was for Tip. Yeah, and like seeing that he won twenty one final, they didn't do anything. They didn't have they didn't have well just that day, but they didn't really do anything since since being in that um. All Ireland final in 2000 and 2015, or since being in the All Ireland semi final in 2016. And the last, the last year was very disappointing. This was the last years haven't been particularly encouraging from a tip football point of view, but this year it's kind of shown what they can do. And I suppose is it a break from the gods like Quinlan and Reardon weren't meant to be available for tip yesterday, Jerry Dick. So I think that like really everything seemed to be going in their favour and they really produced a brilliant performance to, to see the title. But yeah, they'll have no fear of Mayo whatsoever. And, uh, Obviously, we'll we'll wait and see how it uh, how it transpires. But um, if the if the, the gods truly are involved, then it, obviously we know it's the same hundred years um, on the same exact same semi final lineup. And you know, without ruining it for anybody, tip tip won it. So uh, we'll move on. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, the Ulster one, where again there was you know a, a remarkable result and a, a team um, in Cavan who have played four matches in the championship this season and I'll give them I'll give them you know their dues that I expected them to beat us 
um, Antrim, obviously. Um, but um, the other three, I didn't really give them much hope. You know, maybe a wee chance against Down, but I would have Monaghan no chance, Donegal no chance, and they just they, they cannot be second. They they um they just keep coming through these games and like they won the game yesterday by four points, but like it would have been I would actually have been a travesty if they had a lost that game. I think Jerry did fantastic. Everything really, really like they played, they played super football. They really went to that goal. They were brave. They were courageous, and they really got their just reward. I think that they were it would have been an absolute travesty if they hadn't won the game because the two black cards they got were probably on the softer side. And I suppose it was the same just going back on a tip game. The goal Tipperary got a goal that's loud. It should never been disallowed. I don't think that was very technical within the rules, whatever. But these going off the pitch and fractions with the keeper and all that. But I do think that Cavan like they really really played super and. I wonder was that written in the stars too? Like the four games they've been behind at half time and against Monaghan and against them um, down they looked dead and buried, especially against down. I well, did both games. They were ten points down against down and six points down against Monaghan, but not that much time remaining. So they really came to the four yesterday. And I think Tony Gall just had a really really bad day at the office. I don't think that you could really blame the sideline or anything. I think that they didn't really try and complicate things too much. They just didn't really have a good day. And I think Nicky Graham and David Power. Like they've the two of them have produced between it's between them. Like I think Graham has done more than this, but the four four unbelievable results. Like, the, like David Power won another the minor with Tip in 2011. He won a a Munster title with Tip yesterday, and Mickey Graham won a Leinster championship with Mullen Yachta at half parish in Longford, and like two years ago. And now he's after winning Cavan's first first Munster title in 23 years. But the real great football people in Cavan and um, Jerry they are, and they really live for the game and. They're the historical kings of Ulster football, really. But I suppose the problem for Cavan is maybe since the 1950s and maybe the early 60s, we haven't really seen that as much. Do you know that kind of way? Like, so when I said it to you after the Antrim game, I thought they actually played quite well. I wasn't, people were saying they didn't play well against Antrim, but they should be winning this easily. But I think Antrim are actually a good team and they actually have to play well to beat Antrim. And I think there was the same against Down. So I think Mickey Hart in the studio yesterday would have been very disappointed because they would have fancied if they'd thrown, if they had got over the goal, they probably would have fancied as the wind there. But look, all the matters of Cavan are there now and I suppose they'll be very, very much up against it against Dublin in the in the, in the semi-final. One thing, uh, I know I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm reaching for, you know, ways we'll go on to Dublin in the minute, but like I feel like I'm reaching for ways, you know, for teams to beat Dublin. I say as about me, you know, like they'd scored 12 goals and... Um, like I'm sort of thinking about Cavan, and they do look at times like they're a tough nut to crack. Um, certainly, you know, like they, they held Donegal to 12 points. Um, you know, they're going to really have to be, you know, super, super, super strength to, to to stop the Dubs. Like they just seem, they just seem like a juggernaut at the minute. You know, they're just so hard to hard to stop. But um, what, what what do you think? Like like what? Do you see anything that, that, that they can work on to, to try and stop the dubs? But I think Jerry that they were treatment with they've been going as underdogs. And I think that yesterday they were given no chance really. And the cabin people, the players was believed they could win. Graham has beaten the underdog a lot in his management career. So I don't see why I th- I think they have absolutely nothing to fear going into play Dublin. And there have been some very against the head results in this championship results that wouldn't have been expected. And I think that Mead were very, very poor against Dublin, and we're going to get that onto that in a second. But I don't think Cavan can be as bad as Mead were in that game, to be honest, Jerry. I think that, like, they, 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 they're going into that game with nothing to fear. Like, they, they've won the Ulster Championship, they're under no pressure, and anything's a bonus, bonus territory now. But having said that, Dublin, we keep saying it, though, and it's, it's still a very valid point. They're so good at just not taking things for granted and, and maintaining that level of performance, no matter who they're playing. So... There's no reason to think it would be any different against Cavan. And I think I might have said on the show when Donegal bet our mad Jimmy Gillis was straight on saying, no, they haven't bet Cavan. And people were nearly laughing at saying, oh, Jimmy, you're only talking about. But like, the, when people were kind of already looking ahead to a Donegal Dublin semi final after the Armagh game, and maybe even after Donegal bet Tyrone. And like, even after the Armagh game, there was three games, three results had to go the way before Dublin and Donegal transpired. And okay, Dublin did win their two games, but Donegal didn't. And I wonder, did the players. I don't know now they get caught up and complacent on the day or whatever it was, but they didn't really perform anywhere near their capable of. And although it, that that's probably unfair on Cavan and then take it away from from them because the two Galligans were fantastic. They had a few lads who played brilliantly. Cavan did on the day, and they just didn't want to lose. The tackles very hard. They took their chances and they played like a team who 
felt they could win, believed they could win, and I suppose they got the breaks. And look, Donegal will be will be very disappointed. You know, there's no doubt, no no point in saying otherwise. But it's it's the third year in a row that Donegal have actually fell at this hurdle. They fell to Throne and Mayo in 2018, 2019, respectively, and now to Cavan. But the common denominator in all of those games was that this was it was essentially a quarter final in the sense that the winner went to a went to a semi final. Now none of those games were officially quarter finals, but they were. They may as well have been like they, they had they had three do or die games and they failed in the last three years and that'll be very very disappointing from the Donegal perspective. Yeah, I think um, like when I really look at it, just from like thinking of Donegal and the first black card that Cavan got in the um, the first half, I think they were leading by about three or four points at that time. But whenever you look at the final score, like Donegal probably put about half their points that they got in the whole game during that 10 minute spell and you know they, they kind of got that spell where they were three behind and by the time your man was coming out it was like they were kind of you know two or three behind so it, you you would wonder like what were they doing for the other 60 minutes one player that that you know i have to say i, I was a wee bit disappointed with and done a in the championship this year is, is uh, michael murphy um i expect it more from him i think there was definitely i don't think he's, he's i think he scored one point yesterday um and there was maybe one of the games before he scored one point and he was like a, I've been keeping an eye on him, especially because I have him in my my fantasy team, and he, he wasn't uh, he wasn't doing the business for me. So um, there's a wee bit of disappointment there, but you know ultimately they'll they'll look at themselves as a collective, and uh, you know this was an opportunity for them, and uh, it's gone. So yeah, it's disappointing as well from that perspective, and I think Murphy does actually offer Donegal an awful lot in a lot of ways. I think, especially in the other games against Sean and Armagh. And yesterday, I think even he did a bit defensive work yesterday. I think he reads the game well and he gets on a lot of balls. So I think that Murphy's role is often understated. I think he still contributes an awful lot regardless. And he's a very, very consistent performer. But I think yesterday, the whole Donegal team would be very disappointed with their performance. Like, they just, just things didn't go right for them, Jerry. Like, they were getting chances they were missing. They weren't missing them against um, Sean and Armagh. And I think that they were going in for goals and they weren't really. Raymond Gallagher and the Cavan Goldman was having a great game but one talking point and I'm surprised it hasn't been mentioned more is the refereeing in the GA now I, I'm not I were, this is applicable to football and hurling but I think that there's been a few decisions that have been I wouldn't say they've been borderline the referees may have been right I don't think even yesterday with the two black cards they probably do harsh but maybe they were black cards by the rules to be fair but I'd like to see the introduction of a VAR or a TMO in the GA jury I think it would actually work far, far better in the GA than it does actually in soccer. I think it doesn't. The soccer probably is one of those sports where, especially with the offside, the VAR mightn't actually work. But I think in the GA it would be more like the rugby, where a lot of the stuff would be black and white. And I think, especially with those decisions yesterday, and more so the square ball in the Tipperary and court match, if we had someone looking at that, the GA rules are very black and white. They are, you know, the tackle in, in Gaelic football is a funny rule. And apart from that, the rules are very, very clear cut there, you know. And I'd love to see an introduction of a TMO. I think yesterday, if we could even have saw those two black cards and say, well, there was their deliberate, the contact shows that this was deliberate body contact after the ball was played, or if it couldn't be proven to be deliberate, or we could we could explain was it a black card, or with the goal, there could have been a TMO or whatever saying in the studio that they get, we can see here that your man has clearly not been in the square or been in the square or gone out with the boundaries, whatever the decision is. And I think that, that would be far, far more beneficial. I'd like to get your own thoughts on that, Jerry. Do you, do you think yourself that the, the TMO or VAR could work well in the GA? Um, the, the way, well, the, the way I'm honest, like, I think for for a very start, um, black, yellow and red cards, sometimes, you know, like, what exactly, like, sometimes, it, like, I'm questioning, you know, like, what, what what is a black card, what is a yellow card? Um, with regards to technology, I think it comes down to expense. Um, like there's a, there seems to be a lot of games that I've watched, and I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, obviously, but I know like the Hawkeye thing, you know, for like to see, you know, if if it was or it wasn't a point. Like if I'm if I'm not mistaken, there's only certain stadiums that have that. At the moment, they're all uh, Mark Jerry. Uh, just uh, Mark, Jerry. Uh, so like I I don't like I've noticed a few times where like you're just kind of like there was even one there was a Donegal one which I think I do think was just wide. Um, but I don't like the fact that there are certain stadiums where, yeah, if you're playing your match here, um, we've got this technology in place to do it, and there's not. So if you're going to be going down the lines of like a VAR or something like that, it needs to be for the same competition. Like any stadium then that's going to host an All Ireland match or a, a provincial championship match has to have it. And if they don't, uh, I'm not interested, to be honest. I, like, I remember in, the, in soccer a few years ago, 
um, the FA Cup. Um, they done the FA Cup and they had uh, VAR in it, but it was only in stadiums that were Premier League stadiums. I remember there being a game, I think it was Nottingham Forest against someone, and there was like two really like potential like bad calls from the referee, which if it had been at a different stadium that had VAR, could have went differently. <clears throat> and I just think if you're going to introduce these things, it has to be right across the board. So as everybody has the same opportunities, the same chances, and you know we're not saying, well, you know, if that game had been at Crook Park, you know, that call would have been different and potentially changed the games. And I think that the Hawkeye is actually very expensive and it's a complicated procedure, Jerry. But I think the VAR or TMO could be done centralised in a location. I, I think so. I think they, they see it in the soccer. I think it's the Stanley Park has it in the Premiership. There's the one kind of VAR centre for everyone. I, I, I don't think the TMO would be... I think the, the Hawkeye, I actually agree with it. Normally it's used in Parky Cueve and Semple Stadium and Turles Alam, but it should be in every ground. I think it, I think what I'd like to see with the Hawkeye is every ground, the same competition, every game has to have it definitely 100%. I'd, I'd, I'd be on your side 100% there. But I do think that the VAR, I think that it's, it wouldn't be overly impractical. But I think the GA have, they need to get the clock has been voted in. It seems to be, they don't seem to want to implement the stop in the clock and the Hoosier kind of system as well for, for some reason. I think that and the VAR, like I, I, I think with such big, such a stake, and with the red cards and everything being so important, I, I, I'd like to think that an extra pair of hands with the referee could be could be very beneficial. Because also, if we were reminded, we could actually see, and it, it actually helps them to explain decisions too. We can see what this is as well, and that like. So, I think that I'd like to see the AR. Be, I, I'd like to see a debate, and I'd like to see it maybe trials for the National League or something to see what it adds to the game and. I was literally reading quotes from Pat McAnally, the former referee, but he was kind of making the point that the VAR in the soccer, when I've seen it often, it would drive you mad with this offside millimetres, but he was trying to make the point that the, the majority of decisions in the soccer, have, it has been getting right, the VAR. Like It's not like it has been getting most of them wrong, I suppose. The, it, it, the technology is something where, I suppose we saw with Pepe yesterday in the Arsenal Leeds match where it was able to spot a red card. That's an example where it should be used for clear-cut incidents. Well, the Man United game the, the day before probably wasn't an example of where it should be used. But I think in the rugby that worked well, I, it would be something I'd like to see trialled, even in, if it was just for a league for a few weeks and have a debate if it was brought out. I, I, I'd like to see it. Um, I'd like to see more of a debate on it, Jerry, to be honest. I, th- I think it is always a, it always a, is interesting. You know, like if you're getting the decision right, whenever, um, obviously... It doesn't apply to the GAA sorts because I'm, I'm sort of thinking along the lines if you're in um, a professional sport and you know there's finances at stake, which obviously you know there is there is finances at stake. Obviously, you know players aren't paid as such, but you know getting a run to the All Ireland and whatever you know money's you know that comes in with that or whatever. If you're getting the right decisions, um, you know it's good. But obviously, you say about the about the VAR in football or uh, the soccer and. Um, I always like my attitude towards the, the VAR would be if you can tell the first time you see it what what the decision is, but see this nonsense where they're watching like four hundred times and then they're like like you know there was like um his baby toe was offside or backside was on onside or whatever you know that to me is too that to me is too much um definitely um. There are there are certain aspects in uh, Gaelic football, you know, where where it would be um, a benefit. But as as we say, you know, welcome down the cost. And if um, if it's cheaper, you know, than than uh, getting Hawkeye and then you know film, why not try it and see what it's like? And and also, we are in some. It's good when it's used for clear and obvious errors. And as you said, Jerry, anything else, it, it's not really that. But if it's any debate about it, then. It ruins it completely, you know, with this millimeter and these compasses and everything, you know. But it's for clear and obvious errors, it's, it's definitely the way to go. But just going back to the other game now, just to move on, and Dublin and me, there's probably not a lot to say here on this match, only that Dublin were as expected as the usual standards and that me were, well, very, very poor. There, there was like, um, the, the, I, 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 there was there even much more than the me went through with a chance to score a goal within a minute. And you know, you thought, oh, they scored a goal here. They didn't score. Then Dublin just started the scoreboard. The scoreboard just started to tick and tick and tick and tick. And me were stuck on two points, two points, two points, two points. Just everything. Just Dublin just kept adding up, adding up, adding up. 
And brutally honest, I turned it off. <laughs> so did I was I was kind of one of them things where I was I was watching it and I, I just hoped for a good game. You know, like like, like don't get me wrong, the dubs, you know, the, the credit to Dublin and what they do. Um, you know, they like they are they're, they're just like a machine at times, you know, they just the way they, they play, the way they move it, the way there's what they, they see that you would honestly think sometimes they have twenty five men on the pitch, like just the way they move it. Um but Unless, you know, like there's great teams and you can watch great teams, but it's always better watching great teams whenever they're being tested. And it doesn't feel like Dublin have been tested in a, in a while. Like, you know, certainly like like this this campaign, obviously, you know, they've played three teams and they were strong, strong favourites to win them all. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens, whether somebody can, can lay a glove on them. But just from watching that, it just like it's just really hard to see anybody else and like the consistency in performance as well. It's like like you looked at Donegal and Donegal were really good against Tyrone. They were really good against Armagh, and then you know they were flat yesterday. And like Dublin just do not look like there's any chinks in the armor. I think for, yeah, that's a credit thing that they don't um, drop the performance level, whoever they're playing, because that's what a lot of good teams. The only thing I can really think of the used to be. Very notorious for that as well. Where the old Kenny Herders back in the North, he's kind of they used to be the same. Whoever they were playing, they always played well and they always kind of up their game. And Dublin, so that's why it's very, very hard to see them drop into a level where Cavan would beat them in the semi final. But I think out with the three teams left, Mayo, Tipperary, and Cavan, without being disrespectful, and Mayo were probably the only ones you could see who would have any sort of a chance of beating Dublin, to be honest with you. But I think John Cannellan is good. Good, good lad from Westmead there. He wrote a letter about the whole thing. He's after getting a bit of coverage about Dublin's advantages or disadvantages in Leinster. And I think it's, it's definitely a valid debate, like I suppose, how how much resources they have. But that shouldn't be an excuse for how bad Mead were at the weekend, Jerry, to be honest. I think that like that's 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 not that's not um, that's not that's not any like Mead can't even take any solace from that whatsoever. They like, you know, and I think another thing that this is this is the other side of the debate, a very worthy debate is that the Leinster teams Okay, they haven't been doing well against Dublin, fair enough, but they're not really doing well against other teams as well. So I think that the reality is, Jerry, that Leinster football outside of Dublin at the moment is in an absolute crisis mode. Uh, there's, there's obviously there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at the whole situation in Leinster, and it's you know at the end of the day, if you don't like the Dubs dominating, and do something about it, and the way to do something about it is you know to really, really invest in. It starts off at at, um, at grassroots and and uh, the younger, but the problem is then as well is the Dubs have got so much more money. They've got so much more of a population. Like it's it's easy to say, and and believe me, I have been one of the people that have said it about you know the amount of money that's pumped into Dublin GAA. But at the same time, there's like about fifteen to twenty percent of the people that live in Ireland live in live in County Dublin, like. You know, so there is going to be more people. There's going to be more clubs. Um, if you if you're saying like for every, you know, player that's signed to a Gaelic, um, Gaelic football or, or hurling team, and you're paying a certain amount per person, the amount of money is going to go into Dublin. Is going to naturally be more. Um, what the GAA maybe need to do is you know try and, but like like again, I can see it from Dublin. You know, like you can see like. Like I don't want all this money going into Dublin just to strengthen an already very strong county. Whereas I can see that you know at the same time they are making the most of it. Do you know what I mean? Like like like, like not like it's not like even you look at like all our sports and like some teams that are have got the most money they don't win out all the time. And like Dublin, like even even whenever like they've won the five All Irelands, like I don't think like I don't think they had to use the back door once, did they? Like so they they've consistently beat everybody. Over them five years, so you're talking like like uh, certainly then went through the super eights and stuff. Did they lose? Did they lose a game in the super eights? No, so they didn't even. Um, so like you know, the, the be as consistent is that no matter how much money you have, how much you're getting pumped in. What what are they like at underage? I haven't heard like I haven't heard of them. Like I heard me have beat them a few times in underage. Like are they really like getting big results or is there a future for someone else? Well, they've won four. <laughs> Since 2008, past plans since Kerry last one in just to example, because Kerry have won five All Ireland minors in a row, but Dublin have won four All Ireland under 20s in the last few years, most notably in 2000. And I think the, the last one they won was in 2000 and, um, 2017. Well, that was the under 21, but they won a few of those championships as well. Like, so they kind of are 
They're very consistent at under 20 level. Like the minor have been great, but they seem to be bringing players to. And Kildare did win another in 20, 2018, but they were a lot better than Dublin. But that year, I think they bet Kerry by a point or two. But Kerry, David Clifford and Sean O'Shea were missing for Kerry with the with the with the new rule that said that you couldn't play senior and play under 20. Like so I think that while now that's not to take away from Kildare, they fully just they deserved the All Ireland. They were the best team in the competition that year. I don't think I think if Kerry had David Clifford and Jonathan, they would have won that All Ireland. To be honest, you know, I I just think that there's no like, but it, well, Kildare and me should be doing an awful lot better for the tradition they have and for the resort like the, the population that they're kind of getting in. And they've good underage teams as well, so I'm very disappointed in those counties that are not making more of an effort. Like because I I just think that. Like, okay, if if Dublin, like, if you look at someone like Tyrone or someone, if they were going to play in Dublin, they mightn't win, but they'd give them a right game. they put in a big effort. Like, it's the same with Mayo, and it's the same, with, like, even last year, people would say Mayo, Mayo did lose the game by an awful lot, but they were winning a half time. And me didn't seem to be in the game at all, or they didn't lay a glove in Dublin at all. Like, I just think that it's too easy for me to point the finger at somewhere else. And, like, the realistic was they, they scored four points against Dublin last year. In the Leinster final this year, they scored nine points, so they're not. Like, they have to look at their own heads and why they're not playing well. And it's, I just think that the, all the Leinster teams in the last, like, like West Mead won the Leinster championship in two thousand and four, and since then Dublin have won all but one championship. Mead bet them in two thousand and ten, but they've won every single championship since then. Dublin have, and they've won ten Leinster championships in a row now. And like the way it's going, it's very hard to see them not winning the next ten Leinster championships. It's uh, it's di- it's difficult to see. Um, it's di- definitely difficult to see them losing. And obviously, I know you say as like the teams realistically, the one that we would maybe think, you know, certainly, you know, they've obviously got their few finals and they had a good go at them in a few finals was Mayo. But even this Mayo team, like, I think whenever the the game against Leitrim and the the Connacht Championship, um, I think they had like seven or eight debutants. You know, so it's a, it's a very new team as well. So like, are you know, it might take a couple of years even for them, and uh, it just uh, it, it is hard to see anybody beating the dogs. Like, um, mm-hmm. one other thing I wanted to just say to you about the um, the championship, and obviously that with this being a condensed championship, um, I was thinking about it earlier, and obviously Dublin, you know, Leinster's a big, big um, provincial competition anyway, so they obviously got they didn't have a bye, but they still had three games to go. But the other teams, if you look at it, um, Mayo had to go go through. You know, they started off in the um, the preliminary round. Um, Tip were in the preliminary round, and Cavan were in the preliminary round. So, like, there, there's an argument. Like most people would have probably said, you know, it's going to be very very hard for teams to come through um, playing every week, basically, in the championship. But the fact is, the teams that have played the most football. Or the four, or you know the teams that are in the semi-finals, and it's um, I just thought it, I just thought it was interesting. So what what did, would you make of that? Yeah, it's actually interesting. it was weird. It didn't make that for these really good standards and getting the match sharpness at that at that high level. I suppose I think Dublin were going to win it no matter if whatever round they started in Leinster, but the rest of them are probably interested. I think the Mayo one that's actually very relevant, Jerry, because I think Galway didn't really have any sort of match before they played Mayo. Mayo had had two. Championship games at full intensity, and this was maybe Ross Common didn't really have a championship match either, but they had had issues with COVID. Like, so I think that it, it actually is an interesting point. And Cavan, it's rare enough for team wins Ulster, it was very rare team will win Ulster to the preliminary. And now Cavan's done it, and Dunny Gall did it in 2018. Like, so, but I suppose I think those things probably aren't as, as much of a factor as, as sometimes the results show that they might be. This, I think that sometimes they have to be looked in a picture maybe for numerous years to see any sort of trend emerging. But no, it's an interesting point to make. But I actually think that the, the, the best team to stop Dublin is still, and I've been very consistent in this view, and I think they're the only team anywhere near beating them are the Kerry footballers there. I think that they absolutely messed up really badly against Cork. I keep going back to that game, but I just think that Cork bet them fair enough. It was last week, but I think Cork deserved luck because Cork didn't even have to play well to beat Kerry. Like Cork didn't have to play absolutely out with their skin to win that game. And I, ju- I do think Kerry are the team that will beat Dublin eventually, Jerry. And I, I think one county who... Actually, I think the next county who's likely to beat them, and there, again, there are probably people who won't agree with this, are the Tyrone footballers. I think they actually have potential to be a very, very good team. I think they were a bit unlucky with injuries this year, but they haven't been, apart from maybe one semi final, they haven't ever been that, that far away from Dublin either. Like, you know, and they're always a team that plays with a bit of belief. So I think those counties are probably the next two that could beat Dublin, Jerry, are Kerry and, and Tyrone. Okay, well, um, there is a week 
match break in the football this this uh, weekend, so there is no um, no matches coming up. But we'll see. Obviously, you know, if we can we can find to find some stories or somebody to talk to and see see what we can do. But um, thanks anyway. Um, thanks again as usual to um, Connor with the, his knowledge, his information. Um, he's a wee encyclopedia there. So um, thanks to, to him for for coming on again. We will be back. Um, shortly with uh, the hurling discussion, there was a, a load of matches again in the hurling. So um, we'll be back after uh, after a few minutes here with the hurling. So if you want to join us again, then. So thanks for watching, and my thanks to Connor.